you, Charlie. Um, so, as Charlie introduced, the Institute uh, is the Institute for Peace and Economics. Why would it study terrorism? Uh, terrorism in the post 9 11 era has been one of the greatest threats to through global security and peace. And uh, from that aspect, the Institute started studying terrorism. Uh, the terrorism index is sort of came out from our global peace index, as Charlie mentioned, uh, that is sort of the, the major uh, index that measures peace across 163 countries and ranks them uh, on 23 indicators in three different domains. Um, and global terrorism index is part of that. Uh, but also we launched global terrorism index uh, by itself and the trends and the results of terrorism index then flows into, into that uh, global peace index. Uh, now, the Global Terrorism Index is in its sixth year. What we do is with the Global Terrorism Index is that it measures the impact of terrorism across 163 countries related to each other. So it's directly comparable what the ranking on the Global, Visa, the global Terrorism Index is directly comparable between these countries despite the differences in the population sizes or despite the differences in where in the world they are located or what region. Um, it's part of the Global Peace Index developed by the Institute for Economics and Peace. And uh, it's guided by an international expert panel uh, of experts on the, on the field of terrorism. In the 2017, uh, 2019 uh, Global Terrorism Index, the map sort of shows the global ranking. The darker red uh, I'm not good with color, so I <coughs> would just call it red. <laughs> uh, the darker red are the countries most affected, um, and we see very few of those. If we see there's Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, uh, and that's pretty much uh, sort of the, 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 the major impact of terrorism happens in a very small number of countries. And later on, we'll discuss that, that that is associated with wars or conflicts in those countries. Uh, so one of the platforms where terrorism grows and terrorism uh, <laughs> finds its footing is where there's already institutional vacuums, where there's no governments, where there is uh, weak law enforcement, there's weaker domestic control on, on on political space, but also on the physical space where uh, these groups can hire and uh, train and and, re and group and, and undertake their operations. Um, then we have sort of the, the sort of the lighter red color where we see uh, some impact of terrorism, at least one incident. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the Global Terrorism Index takes four indicators into account, and that's the incident of terrorism, deaths from terrorism, injuries from terrorism, and properties destroyed. Uh, they have different weighting. Of course, deaths from terrorism gets the bigger weight, and the, uh, unfortunately, the country is suffering from greater number of uh, casualties uh, turn out uh, lower on the index. So the, the lighter countries experience some, some level of terrorism incidents and deaths and injuries, and the lighter the color gets and the more we get to yellow and the blues, uh, then the, the impact of terrorism uh, almost disappears. Countries most affected by terrorism in 2019, uh, one of the biggest change in this year's index was that Iraq is no more the most affected country. Uh, this is following the defeat of uh, Islamic State uh, uh, group in, in Iraq by the US-led international coalition and the Iraqi forces. Um, and that's one of the biggest learning through the, through the big wars that happened in the post 9-11 era is that smaller scale targeted operations uh, led by the local and sort of indigenous uh, forces or sort of the, the local uh, governments are better placed to defeat and create those sort of mitigate those unmanaged or ungoverned spaces uh, leading to decline in terrorism. And that, a, a great example of that is Iraq. However, 
Afghanistan, the other sort of uh, major war, uh, actually escalated and experienced a higher uh, terrorism this year, um, and went from being the second most affected country to the first most affected country. Other countries in the, in the top 10 uh, countries are Nigeria. Nigeria is experiencing uh, sort of a, a conflict between the farmers uh, in, in, in parts of the country, but part of that, the Islamic State group and Boko Haram uh, <coughs> undertakes terroristic activities and, and uh, uh, do operations and even captures areas and has been <coughs> very dominant. Uh, Syria has been, uh, has had an experience of ISIS growing in there, but also there are other terrorist groups. Uh, but it stays stayed on its <coughs> uh Pakistan is a more stable country, but the reason it's experiencing terrorism is that uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, terrorist groups in a sense that they're not actively participating in violence, but their presence uh, still uh, causes incidents of terrorism, but also deaths and injuries from terrorism. Um, Somalia experiences, Somalia for a long time experienced uh, sort of was an ungoverned space in a sense that the governments failed time and again and provided that space for terrorist groups, for insurgents to grow and to, to be present and to actually fill that governance vacuum and, and through that sort of project their activities. Um, India is another interesting case in a sense that uh, when we study India in terms of peace and conflict and terrorism, it's not very easy to imagine sort of uh, what are happening, but uh, it's one of the countries that experiences very high number of conflicts. There are small conflicts across different domains. Uh, the most famous there is the Kashmir issue that is between uh, Pakistan and India. That rivalry has, rivalry has been going on for over 70 years uh, and has recently uh, picked up uh, in, in terms of uh, India sort of canceling a law that uh, that protected or given the Kashmir as, as a special status in the Indian, uh, Indian uh, constitution. Uh, but apart from that, uh, India is also experiencing um, left-wing or sort of communist uh, sort of uh, ideological uh, conflicts in, in certain parts. Uh, and there's also some other uh, religious sort of uh, uh, groups that, that undertakes uh, violent activities. Um, Yemen has been suffering from, from terrorism for a long time. It's war, the civil war, it's not the civil war, sort of the war that uh, is led by Saudi coalition has uh, provided even more space for these groups to grow. Uh, Philippines uh, experience, since 2014, there has been in the Mandanao region they experienced a rise of the ISIS and an escalation of violence. Uh, and I think uh, international forces, including Australian forces, participated in trying to counter uh, that threat uh, in the Philippines. Uh, Congo is another case where uh, the whole country is not affected by terrorism, but in the north of the country, uh, on the border near Rwanda and Burundi, uh, there is a conflict, ha there has been conflict for a long while, and then there is the terrorist activities that are also taking place in that part of uh, Congo. Uh, so these are the 10 most affected countries by terrorism. Um, the good news uh, on the terrorism index in 2019 was that deaths from terrorism are down by 15% from 2018, but they are significantly lower than 2014 where it experienced its peak uh, level of uh, terrorist activities across the world. Um, 94 countries improved on the, on the global terrorism index, which means the level of terrorism impact in these countries decreased. So there, is, there were fewer attacks, there were fewer casualties, there were fewer uh, deaths and injuries uh, from terrorism. And 40 countries deteriorated, uh, where what that means is that these 40 countries uh, experience uh, increases in incidence of terrorism or deaths from terrorism. <coughs> um, while terrorism sort of increased in, in its impact globally, 
there has been, it's still a major threat to the global security and peace. Uh, it has spread wider in, in, into more countries. Uh, 71 countries globally experience at least one death from terrorism. Um, and sort of uh, four more countries suffered a death in 2017. What this means is that while terrorism decreased in 2019, the decrease in terrorism happened in the most affected countries, in Iraq, in Syria, not in Afghanistan, and in Somalia, uh, in Nigeria. These were the countries that experienced a decline in the deaths, and that sort of led to global improvement in terrorism. However, the underlying trend is that at least four other countries, four more countries experienced one death. What that means is that uh, while sort of the high levels of terrorism that are happening, where the platform of war and the platforms of conflict enables terrorism, there are other countries that don't suffer from conflict, they don't suffer from war, they don't suffer from mass violence. There is no sort of vacuum like spaces for terrorism to grow, but terrorism still had uh, an incident or at least one death. Uh, and that's sort of the more concerning uh, aspect of terrorism globally. Uh, and only 26 countries had no, uh, globally only 26 countries uh, had no incidents in the last five years. So when we look at a bit longer period of time, uh, there is only 26 countries that have absolutely zero uh, terrorism incidents. Um, to Europe in the post-2014 era experienced uh, some very uh, sort of devastating level and very high levels of terrorism, uh, and particularly some countries, uh, France, uh, Belgium, uh, and, and Germany were affected uh, pretty badly. Uh, so the, the continent that is the most peaceful continent around the world in our Global Peace Index and has been like that for the last 12 years we're doing the Global Peace Index and probably before that if data was available for us to do it. So it's the most peaceful uh, place on earth, the most peaceful region on earth, experienced a very high level of terrorism. But in 2018, uh, the level of deaths in uh, Europe went down by 70%. Uh, and out of that, uh, out of the 62 deaths that happened in Europe, 40 occurred in Turkey, uh, which, of course, the, the, the proximity to, to the Middle Eastern conflicts could be Sort of well, it's not directly could not be directly attributed, but that could be a reason uh, that sort of uh, uh, drove these uh, forty incidents. Um, as I sort of mentioned repeatedly, 2014 has been the year where global wars and terrorism experienced one of its worst peaks since the end of Cold War in 1992, uh, and uh, since then. It has been on decline. Country to that trend is Afghanistan. is the only country where, if we look at the graph, uh, it has decreased across all these countries. Uh, Nigeria and Afghanistan are the two exceptions that had higher levels since 2017, uh, uh, which sort of in Afghanistan, nearly uh, 7,400 people were killed. That's a very big number uh, in terms of the global statistics from, from terrorism incidents. There's also, in Afghanistan, has been a move towards peace. There is a, a peace negotiations happening, uh, and that sort of shows that the world and both internal players in the conflict have realized that what is happening in Afghanistan is no, no more acceptable, <coughs> both to the people of Afghanistan, but more globally, there has been a very strong uh, contamination of what is happening. So the peace negotiations uh, that are underway uh, as we sort of talk, because uh, I think they were speaking in Qatar yesterday uh, between the US and Taliban uh, representative, uh, could result in a settlement that could uh, drive that war into some sort of conclusion that the violence that is happening reduces in that. Uh, um, So terrorism deaths, uh, there is sort of a repetitive uh, statistic. It decreased in 2019 by 15%. Um, 
I mean, one of the, the reasons behind the decline in, in, in terrorism has been, as I mentioned earlier, the learning that happened that the major surges that were happening post-Iraq war, the, the idea was to send more troops that controls and that would re lead to reduction in violence and reduction in the war, actually didn't work. Uh, and the, sort of the, the, the international community learned that it is actually creating local capacity. Uh, supporting the local forces, the local governments, uh, not only sort of supplying them with weapons to fight, but also creating institutions, democratization, and other um, uh, sort of trying to fill that vacuum that drives terrorism is actually a more effective tool in driving down terrorism rather than trying to fight it uh, with with big number of soldiers and, and on on the ground. Um, this shows the top 10 countries uh, most affected. Uh, so 46% of the deaths happened uh, in Afghanistan, and uh, the other uh, sort of Nigeria and Iraq followed, follows that, uh, that uh, trend. And while all the other countries in the world uh, had only 13% of those deaths happen there, uh, so the, the bulk of the terrorism happens where there is wars, where there is conflicts. We also measure the economic impact of terrorism. Uh, while the economic impact of terrorism don't cover all the losses that terrorism brings to a country, we try to, uh, to, to measure as much as possible with the available data. Um, in 2018, there was over $33 billion worth of losses from terrorism. And those losses were driven by deaths from terrorism and the GDP losses uh, or the reduction in economic growth in the countries affected with the high level of terrorism. Um, as a percentage of GDP, this reflects exactly what we saw in the impact of terrorism. Afghanistan spends nearly 20% of its GDP, or it's the total economic activity happening in the country, into terrorism. Uh, Iraq, uh, which was pretty high in the previous years, have uh, now around 4%, in Nigeria there's around 3%. What this tells is that if the counter-terrorism or, or trying to reduce the impact of terrorism in these countries by improving the condition that sort of uh, it mitigates terrorism, we could achieve economic benefits. And this is uh, where the policymakers dilemma comes from. Of course, uh, all the policymakers, both global and national, uh, response to the human toll of terrorism uh, but there is also the economic argument of, of uh, trying to reduce uh, terrorism, not only through sort of fighting, but also through undertaking peace building, in a sense, improving the positive peace in these countries, which Charlie will talk about in a bit more detail <coughs> later. Um, trends in terrorism, this uh, takes into account the longer term trends, uh, and we can clearly see the different uh, important uh, events that has happened since 1998 uh, that has led to, to increase in terrorism and finally into the reduction <coughs> in terrorism. Um, as we can see, uh, since sort of terrorism existed for a long time, before 9-11, there were terrorist activities around <coughs> the world, there were terrorist groups, uh, and also that 9-11 it resulted from those, the existence of the presence of those terrorism group, terrorist groups. Uh, then there is the invasion of Afga Afghanistan, then there is the Iraq invasion, and there is then the troop surges that happened. Uh, I think both troop surges in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, sort of happened <coughs> in around 2007 to 2009. And then we have the civil war in Syria starts, and that's where there is a huge spike in deaths from terrorism. However, that's not only in Syria. With Syrian war, the Iraq war became worse off. With that, the Afghanistan war became worse off. And even countries in Africa started to experience sort of some of spillovers from these conflicts. And terrorist groups were more bolder, they were more active, they were recruiting faster, and they were creating uh, sort of uh, more uh, uh, chaos and, 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 and violence in these countries. 
Uh, since 2014, global terrorism has experienced a huge decline, uh, and that's nearly 52% uh, reduction in the deaths from terrorism. Um, in terms of the deadliest groups, uh, <coughs> we take the, the data from 1999. Um, when ISIS emerged in in 2011, it undertook, it sort of overtook all the groups in 2013. It became the most lethal group or the most uh, deadliest group around the world. Um, however, that's not the case anymore in 2018. Uh, ISIS has lost all the territory it's sort of uh, captured throughout the last three, four years. Um, and. Uh, it doesn't sort of its, its leaders are no more around, uh, and and all that sort of led to the group becoming less and less active, and and uh, uh, the deaths from ICE, uh, Islamic State uh, group decreased by a huge uh, sort of margin. Taliban became the deadliest terrorist group around the world, uh, and uh, they I mean their violence has been increasing since 2011 and 2014. The global forces decreased by a huge margin. Uh, it went down from nearly over 100,000 uh, soldiers to now something around 20,000. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, the peace negotiation uh, hopefully could result into, into reduction in violence uh, from Taliban. Um, while IS, I all, uh, sort of ISIS decreased around the world, uh, it's affiliate groups, one of them, uh, the Khorasan chapter of the Islamic State that uh, is active in Afghanistan, Iran, uh, Pakistan, and India, uh, started to, uh, and, and that's, that, we picked that up because that uh, sort of had higher level of casualties. Uh, there has been many groups in Africa uh, that started to affiliate themselves, I mean they existed before that, but they started to affiliate themselves with uh, Islamic State, uh, uh, whatever the reasons mean, of course it's, it's related to, to the propaganda that they get out of that, and then the, of course the, probably the funding models that they rely on, the support that they get from local populations or even the population sort of, you know, non-local that sort of participates in those groups. Um, and that sort of exists around the world, uh, including many other countries uh, in, in different parts of the world. Um, so these are these were the, the deadliest uh, groups uh, in 2019. What this graph shows is the number of countries uh, that experiences the number of sort of deaths. What we're trying to show here is the fact that the bulk of the terrorist terrorism happens in the few unstable countries around the world. Uh, spaces where uh, there is wars, there are conflicts, um, and there they make a very small number of countries. Uh, on the flip side of this, what it means is that if the global community can help these countries get out of the wars they are, and they are the focus of uh, international policy in terms of peace building, in terms of building institutions in there, in terms of building economies there, in terms of providing opportunity for people and, and, and creating, uh, sort of getting them out of that spaces, then there could be a huge decrease in global terrorism uh, in, in that sense. Um, so only very few countries, even in 2018, experienced a bulk of the terrorism. The gray shows 1 to 24 deaths, and we can see that it's almost 40% of the, the, the terrorism that happens uh, in those countries, while the rest of the 60% happens in a very limited number of countries. This is the, glo the, the global economic impact of, uh, of uh, terrorism uh, since 2000. Um, we can see the 2014 where Global terrorism reached its peak. Uh, the economic impact reached 111 billion uh, dollars. Um, as I said, this is only a very uh, sort of partial estimation of global terrorism because global terrorism also drives bigger wars. They uh, destroy institutions, which is hard to measure in any economic sense. They destroy social cohesion in societies. Uh, that is 
adding a monetary value on that is not easy. Uh, so they have a lot of other uh, damages to, to the societies where this happens, uh, making this a very conservative estimate in that sense. In, in the recent years, uh, another sort of issue that has become part of the terrorism, uh, and especially in the West, is the far-right terrorism. Uh, this is uh, where there's, I mean, the, the definition of terrorism itself is where violence, uh, indiscriminate violence is used to achieve ideological, political, uh, religious, uh, aims through, through violence, but with far right, that's another sort of uh, more, uh, you know, uh, becomes a, a clear political or some sort of uh, other uh, group grievances related uh, aims are achieved through, through violence in, in this type of uh, terrorism. We can see since 2010, of course, I mean, as I said, far right ter terrorism may existed for a long while, but there has been a huge spike since 2010. And uh, while there has been a reduction in the, late, the, 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 the last year, uh, it still stays very high on its historical sort of levels, and that's a concerning issue. Uh, this sort of shows uh, the, what is sort of called political terrorism. Uh, we don't, we, like that, that, it sort of goes beyond only the far right. Uh, this could be on any political reason behind it. This could be far left, it could be far right. Uh, this could be separatist in certain places uh, around the world. Um, and this, we can see there has been single incidents that are very sort of uh, big in, in certain parts. Uh, and then we have the, the, the sort of the underlying trend that it always exists, incidents of it happens, it takes life, it, it creates that violence. Uh, and particularly concerning this, the, the far right terrorism is that it happens in more peaceful societies. It happens in places where institutions are strong. It happens in places where social cohesion is strong. It happens in places, and that's sort of the, 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 the dif that differentiates it from from the overall global terrorism, uh, that's why we sort of uh, study it you know, as a separate phenomenon. Um, this sort of shows uh, a, a trend where, how do you classify this? Uh, whether we can classify all of it or not uh, is, is sort of there shown in this graph and in over time. Uh, in recent year, years, there is a, we can see more of classification, uh, and that classification is not done by the Institute for Economics and Peace. Uh, we get the data for that, for, for that from different sources, and their class is, is their classification. Uh, and when incidents happen, police in those countries uh, classify those as, uh, as far right or far left or some, some kind of terrorism, and that sort of reflects in the data. Um, Conflict and terrorism uh, is sort of conflict is the underlying driver of terrorism, or vice versa. Terrorism could be the underlying driver of certain wars. Uh, so they go together uh, in 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 spaces where there is uh, uh, vacuums of, of governance and all that. Um, once again, 2014 uh, sort of shows uh, deaths from terrorism and battle deaths. Uh, from UCDP uh, in Norway, they sort of record uh, deaths from uh, deaths from uh, uh, conflicts, uh, but deaths from conflict could also include deaths from terrorism. So that's there's an overlap between the two data sets. Uh, exactly the same uh, trend. Uh, this is sort of indexed to one just to see how they have changed over time. So they, it, that this is not the number of deaths; it's the the change in the two phenomena over time, and the change is almost parallel to each other. This is in a number of countries uh, over time, and uh, it's interesting to see in Afghanistan, uh, while there is terrorism, there is also a internal dimension to the war. Uh, given that country was 
unstable even before the 9-11 uh, or before the US uh, arrival in the country. Uh, it suffered a civil war in 1992, uh, and it suffered. It, it went through a period of anti-Soviet uh, uh, war, pretty much fought through guerrilla-style uh, uh, insurgency. Uh, then we see Iraq, uh, and Iraq starts in 2003, post Saddam era, uh, and there is a huge uh, increase in deaths from terrorism and deaths from. Uh, 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 just the battle deaths. There is only very small number of uh, uh, domestic deaths from from things that could not be sort of considered uh, uh, terrorism, and those are the sort of the sectarian violence between different groups uh, and all that, or, or criminally driven uh, violence, uh, given the country experienced uh, increasing political instability over time. Um, then we see sort of uh, Nigeria. Nigerian uh, terrorism is almost uh, sort of embedded in, in the war in the country. Uh, the war in the country is Boko Haram is exploiting grievances between settlers and the farmers, sort of the, the, the nomadic farmers, and creating a narrative around that that uh, drives terrorism in the country. Um, and that's why the the deaths from terrorism and the deaths, the sort of the conflict deaths are almost uh, uh, parallel to each other. Uh, Somalia is another country. Uh, Somalia experienced civil wars uh, uh, for a long time, and, and, and there has been uh, um, sort of ungoverned spaces since uh, the fall of uh, after Cold War. The country went through the fall of. Uh, the communist supported regime and that regime, after the fall of that regime, the country has recently sort of started to experience having a central government government, and then um, uh, and trying to sort of uh, reduce that violence. Uh, and terrorism has been part of that. Al-Shabaab uh, has been driving that terrorism. Uh, there are other groups as well, uh, including Al-Qaeda. and. Uh, some groups have recently uh, started to claim affiliation with the Islamic State uh, as well. Syria, uh, a middle-income country, a very stable country. Of course, it has uh, a lot of internal issues. Uh, and in 2011, where uh, Assad regime uh, sort of was rejected by people, and the, sort of the, the, the initially peaceful demonstrations then turned into a civil war and created a, a human catastrophe, both in terms of uh, the, the violence it perpetrated on its people and the displacement that it caused and, and the pain and suffering that it's still causing uh, for Syrian people. Um, Pakistan is another country, uh, neighboring Afghanistan experienced all sorts of instabilities. Uh, and that spread over to, to Pakistan. Pakistan has been an active part of the Afghan conflict since it started in the 1970s. Uh, the anti-Soviet uh, jihad or rebellion war or whatever we call it uh, was founded or based in, in Pakistan. Um, and since uh, in 1992 when the communist regime fell in Kabul uh, in Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan was part of the civil war. Uh, wanted it or unwanted it because uh, it's, it's, a, it's a neighbor that has deep cultural ties between the two countries. Uh, it's inevitable for Pakistan to be involved, but also there are regional issues for itself to be involved in it uh, till today. Um, but Pakistan signed a peace treaty with the Pakistani Taliban um, in uh, 2009, uh, and since then, it has experienced a reduction in, in, in both uh, deaths from terrorism and the internal conflicts that it's experiencing. Um, targets of terrorism. Um, this is uh, sort of the graph shows uh, the deviation from average uh, from for conflict and non-conflict countries. Uh, for terrorism, uh, for a majority of the, the targets are police and military, then there's sort of the, the unknown uh, aspect of it, then there is uh, non-state militias, uh, of course, private, private, private citizen and uh, property, 
Um, and then there is the infrastructure that they, they have uh, targeted in different countries. Uh, uh, it also sort of shows change of or how, how this terrorism has changed over time uh, in targeting these, uh, in these, these groups. Uh, and government uh, sort of is, is also a smaller target. I mean, the underlying driver behind this is military is always in the war with these groups. So of course it will be the, the most affected you know, uh, party in that, in that while government buildings and government officials are the most protected from, from terrorists. Uh, and terrorists are uh, using insurgent uh, techniques in these wars. They try to avoid places where they suffer from, from casualties as well. Uh, businesses, journalists, media has been affected and that uh, uh, has been reducing uh, in, in the sort of recent times. Uh, of course, tourists, we, we know the cases that happened in Morocco and in other places in, in Africa and in other, in, in other countries, but the most famous ones were uh, in, in Africa on European tourists. Um, there has been a recent sort of uh, change on, in the, on the gender aspects of terrorism. Uh, terrorism and war is, uh, and even uh, when we talk about violence in general, it's a very male-driven uh, phenomenon. But in recent times, there has been a huge increase in female terrorist activities uh, across different countries. Um, so this shows, uh, I mean, the Boko Haram and all other groups, but there's the sort of the spikes in different periods. Uh, is concerning in a sense that uh, increasingly these groups are now getting to phases where female terrorism is attractive to them in a sense that, for example, in the case of Boko Haram in Nigeria, female suicide attackers were not detected, detected easily. The police did not detect them as easily as they did the, the male suicide attackers. And they used that strategy to perpetuate uh, some very damaging violence uh, on, on civilians and also non-civilian targets. Um, so there has been, uh, over time, an increasing uh, focus on trying to bring in more and more female uh, uh, influence on, on sort of female terrorists and, and involve them in perpetrating violence. Um, I mean, it's, it's the issue of gender and terrorism is broader than I mean, one reason, as I said, it's the detection issue. Uh, but the other issue is, of course, media and the media frenzy around terrorism. Uh, increasingly, it's becoming or it's per portrayed as a civilizational war. And that, in a sense, becomes, of course, more attractive to sort of the male, uh, you know, terrorist groups. But then it also becomes attractive to, to women. Another aspect of this, and I don't want to, this to be sort of the main point, but uh, there is an increasing awareness among women of issues. Of course, when there is increasing awareness around issues, there is also easier to, to influence a very small number of people, but then this drives the graphs like this. You know, it's, it's almost non-existence that we get a peak uh, because a very small number, and, and terrorism in, in general, even in the war-affected countries, do not recruit masses. They only recruit very small number of people. They uh, are driven by sort of a very small uh, group of people that doesn't represent anything <clears throat> on any of these countries. I mean, the, the, the ordinary people in many of these countries suffer the most from, from these groups. So they're more the victims of terrorism than anything to say if Afghanistan is more affected, you know, in, not in that sense. And that's the same trend with the female terrorism, that it's a very small number, but when it happens, given the trend is very, the, the baseline is very low, you see these spikes in the graph. So this, this shows uh, the targets, uh, and the, the, we can see the increase uh, for the female terrorists is the, the marketplaces, plazas, and squares. Uh, it clearly brings to mind 
attacks in Kenya, attacks in Nigeria, attacks in, in a number of other places where public spaces such as shopping centers and, and those who are targeted by female suicide attackers. Uh, um, and those, as I said, it's very easier in that sense to for, for the female suicide society attackers to sort of infiltrate and, and undertake this, uh, this violence. Um, I think that's sort of the end of the, the global terrorism part. Um, for a more positive note, hopefully, uh, Charlie can give us something <laughs> to ponder on. So I'll invite Charlie again to, to do this. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Jim. I'll be really quick because we really want to open up for some, some questions. But we uh, I, I love my hip, uh, but uh, our presentation is like a presentation from the Grim Reaper, isn't it? So we like to finish on uh, uh, something that's, that's positive. So I uh, will we'll just touch on positive piece. Uh, so, uh, my who talked to the uh, the Global Terrorism Index. I mentioned the, the the Global Peace Index as well as the Positive Peace Report. All of our research uh, is available, freely available uh, on our website. So please feel uh, free to access uh, the uh, Vision of Humanity website. It's probably the, the quickest way way to get there. Uh, so uh, Positive Peace, we. Uh, the, the, the Global Terrorism Index, our, our most known report, is built on that uh, negative definition of, of peace, and one of the aspects of that negative definition is, is, is terrorism. Uh, so uh, that negative definition uh, being the absence of violence and the absence of fear of violence. Uh, but we also look at peace and measure peace from a positive perspective. So looking at the attitudes, institutions and structures that create and sustain peaceful uh, societies. And really that, uh, uh, that research looking at what is it that makes countries peaceful uh, is the most trans transformational aspect of, of our work. Uh, we often say if, if you want, want to understand the light, you don't study dark. <laughs> or if you want to understand how to be healthy, don't look at a diseased body. Similarly, if you want to understand peaceful societies, how to build so uh, peaceful societies, you need to study peaceful societies, not conflict. So it's a, uh, the uh, growing part of our work is uh, positive peace and how to activate around that, uh, uh, that research on positive peace. Uh, so our research on positive peace uh, draws out uh, uh, the uh, positive peace framework. And we use this framework uh, globally uh, with partners to, to activate on positive peace. And one of the growing aspects of our work is using this framework uh, to work with partners on PV, so preventing violent extremism. And Mo had mentioned this, you know, improving positive peace, improved social cohesion, and that has uh, an impact on that social system to, to build more peaceful communities. So wh what do we know about high levels of positive peace? Higher high positive peace countries are more resilient. So they're more uh, resilient to, to shocks, whether they're exogenous or endogenous shocks. Uh, better able, better prepared, better able to respond, uh, and better able to recover from shocks and terrorism. This is a good example. Of terrorism. Uh, better environmental outcomes, uh, high measures of, of well-being, uh, including social cohesion. Uh, they perform better uh, with development goals. Uh, perform better with uh, a range of economic. So uh, with the partners we, we work with, this is really about to drawing on that framework uh, to shift social systems to, to become more peaceful. I'm going to finish on this slide before we open up to questions. Uh, it really it highlights, uh, when, you, when you look at uh, uh, peacefulness uh, globally, uh, positive peacefulness uh, globally, positive peace has actually improved. Uh, not significantly, but it has improved. Sorry, our charts are always uh, back to front because big number, bad, small number, good. So a line going up is, is uh, uh, a negative indicator. Uh, you can see uh, positive peace has uh, improved uh, somewhat, but it's driven by uh, uh, structures and institutions. The indicator or the domain that has decreased and decreased over the last decade has been attitudes. And you know that intuitively. <laughs> from being a global watch, we, we know that children, uh, our data demonstrates that uh, in a very graphic way. 